Hi there. Welcome tonight to our third commuter Zoom, our fireside chat, and we have a fireside here in cold Melbourne this evening. I'm glad that you could be with us. I'm glad that you can join Francesca and I as we have a conversation about this exciting new opportunity that Francesca is bringing to us, exploring pastoral and spiritual care in suffering, grief and loss. Thanks, Francesca, for being with us tonight. It's lovely. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about this evening. We're going to spend some time for the next oh, 45 minutes, perhaps, talking about that course and about some principles of pastoral and spiritual care, particularly pertaining to that. And I'm conscious that for some people, there may be some triggers that, um, that you need to follow up afterwards. And I'd encourage you to do that, to find a trusted person that you can talk with about some of the questions that emerge for you. Um, we, we are aware that the conversations around grief are all of our conversations and loss are all of our conversations. So it's our human experience that, that, we're, that we're gonna be talking about. My name is Anne Mallaby and I'm the uh, Academic Dean at Whitley College and um, I'm delighted that Francesca Nutzelesi is joining me from the Netherlands. Francesca was a student with us, she's been a lecturer with us and now she will be an adjunct lecturer teaching all the way from the Netherlands um, in this next semester. And you are coming with your experience and your story to this evening. You'll have some questions, no doubt, that you might want to ask along the way. And you can put those into the chat box and, uh, and we'll attempt to address those as the evening goes on. So join us in the conversation and we'll pick up some of the threads of the thoughts that are running through your minds as we go, go through. So, Francesca, tell us a little bit about what it is that brought you into this area of pastoral and spiritual care, particularly in this experience of grief and loss. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Anne. And uh, thank you, Whitley community, for inviting me to be back with you after a few years. Uh, it gives me really great joy and uh, uh, to be to be offering this course at this particular time in our history. Um, what, what brought me to spiritual and pastoral care wasn't that direct line, to be honest. You know, I started my journey wanting to uh, serve God in ministry in some kind of form and shape. And I thought it would be in the form of a missionary. And I had all fantasies about going to some exotic country. And uh, then I ended up living in the U.S. for 20 years, and uh, that's exotic on its own. <laughs> but uh, before I did that, I, I, um, I was encouraged to really listen, listen for God's guidance in my own life about what this vocation was about. Like, what, what was about the need to help others? Where was it coming from? And because of that listening, I ended up coming to Whitley for a Master of Theology uh, under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Bruce Rumbold, who has uh, continued to stay in my heart and in my ears when uh, I teach students. Uh, this year, so Whitley, were not only informative, but very transformative for me. And I got a clarity about this, uh, um, this desire and, and, and this, uh, this, this gift that was affirmed by my mentors and professors and colleagues to put together theology and psychology, like the human sciences and the study of our faith and our spiritual resources in order to understand how to best help human beings, especially in the context of suffering because that's the thorn, you know, in human experience, you know, when we are doing well, we're enjoying life, we don't turn to very crucial questions, as we do when we're hurting. And uh, that's where all the questions about where is God in the midst of this? And uh, how do we cope? What are our best resources? And, uh, um, and, and, and so I got really curious, intrigued and committed to the study of this. And then it became my, my life journey and my profession uh, for, for the past many years. So in, in a way, I kind of responded to the needs of the world and to the gifts that God had placed and the interest in myself to, to bring these two together and develop um, a real 
specialization, if you will, in spiritual and pastoral care. So well, I, I'm, I, I'm struck as you talk about that, Francesca, that you're talking about um, discernment and you're talking about study and the various aspects of that. It strikes me that that really is about listening yeah, at its heart, which is the core of pastoral care, really, isn't it? The capacity to listen deeply to what's happening and attend to what it is that's going on in self and other. Yes, yes, and it, it, it really is at the heart of everything. I mean, I've been uh, working in uh, anti-trafficking environments, you know, for the past few years, and I've had this question, you know, people ask, like, how did you choose this? And it's like, you don't really choose, you know, trauma, hurt, suffering. If you are a normal, healthy human being, you want to run the other way. But if you are in a journey of discernment, you know, an openness to listening to where God continues to open spaces and bring people to you, then that's what emerged for me, that the world was in a state of deep traumatization, you know, the deep suffering all over and around me. And I wished to respond out of my knowledge, since I was teaching pastoral care and, and counseling and theology. So I had, you know, like the, 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 the experience of what the, the human scientists were offering to us, you know, to help us. And I had the need of the people in front of me. So I thought, okay, this is a good way to bring this again into focus, you know, and, uh, and for me to move forward in this direction. And, uh, and that's, that's where that calling has emerged for me. I didn't choose it or look for it necessarily. So that, uh, yeah. That's often the genuine um, Paul, isn't it? Uh, but but I'm curious that you you've um, you've really like you've extended your whole formation in considering the sciences and the understanding of that, and and yet you're doing this in a theological paradigm. So you're holding these two things together, and that that always is the nub of it. A question for me about how we hold this the well, add the extra ingredient of our theological frameworks into this conversation. Tell, tell us about that. I, I think this is the most creative part of our work and the most generative and uh, exciting for me. I call it fun, but I use that word carefully when I'm talking about grief and loss and trauma. But what I mean by that is like, it really excites me. So these things we're learning about the brain you know, through the uh, neuroscientific research, you know, the human brain is, is, it has a lot of neuroplasticity, resilience. It's not a world that I understand really well, but I love to uh, plunge into that knowledge so that I can understand more uh, com the, the complexity of how God has created us. Yeah. Because I, I bring to the task a theological anthropology, you know, like I try to understand human experience from the perspective of, uh, of, of theological frame. So bringing subjects like this that could have been really polarized in opposite, opposite directions together in the task of pastoral care, pastoral counseling, therapy, chaplaincy, it gives so much richness to our work and extra resources to use. Yeah. So it doesn't take anything away from our faith and our spirituality. It adds incredibly um, to it. And interestingly, I will often sit with social workers and nurses and um, people who are in various caring professions and they, and they come to want to study, study theology because they want the something more. The theology doesn't take away from that. It actually builds a, a, a fullness in what they will then offer. Is that yeah? What, yeah, that's the converse, isn't it? Yes, I think one of the most exciting moments in my teaching is really to help the students, like uh, investigate, find out within themselves what is the operational theology that is moving them to their work because sometimes it's not uh, intentionally expressed, like people haven't thought about it or they haven't really um, analyzed what's coming from inside. And uh, we do fun exercises, like I give a case, a situation, and I say, could you offer a prayer? And in the prayer, we see without 
you know, kind of uh, uh, appealing to the frontal lobe of our brain, which is the one of rationality and theology and systematizing things, you see what emerges from the heart is what people really believe. And that is, is a very um, uh, revelational, you know, to the students themselves. And then in conversation with what the people are bringing to the task of care, we can see how that theology is beneficial or sometimes it's uh, not supportive of their healing process, you know, but then we, we can gently look at what's coming from inside. And I think this is a beautiful part of my, of my uh, teaching, you know, that in the classroom, we explore all these things uh, together. Yes, I think so. So um, you've, you've, you've thrown in the term operational theology, which is a favorite of mine and um, has been, you know, used widely in our teaching, which sits alongside that question of um, uh, operational theology and espouse theology. This is not the kind of the doctrinal statements of what I believe. This is actually theology on the run. This is the stuff that comes up when I'm actually put in a place where I'm a little bit uncomfortable. I know, and that is why in, in the classroom, I think one of the most important tasks for a, a professor of pastoral care is to help students be very knowledgeable of that. Because, you know, the espoused theology, the one that they write papers about or they preach sermons about, has the opportunity to be uh, critiqued, you know, like um, articulated properly. But when you are facing somebody who has been deeply hurt, maybe within the church even, or by somebody they deeply uh, cared and, and, and trusted in, and, uh, and, and they hit you with something of theological nature, then you're really on your feet. And so if you hadn't had the opportunity to think through really what, how does God work in this particular situation? You know, have you thought about that in your own life? And before you can speak, you know, that, that, that could be also damaging. You know, we can do spiritual harm to people if we haven't thought through carefully our own theology. And that's why I think the, the classroom is a laboratory, you know, where people have to really work on themselves before they can be... Um, comfortable with all the limitations that we have as human beings you know we don't get perfect before we are launched into the trenches as we used to <laughs> to do with the like clinical pastoral education or something like that you know and uh, but you know to give due importance to the process of formation and reflection uh, and theological investigation i think is the the task of seminary you yes know? that's what we do to prepare people to be in the world. Yes, yes, it, it, there is certainly a, a pairing back or a slowing down that gives us space to attend to um, mm -hmm. what is around us that, that, that is rarely given permission in the rest of the society. And I can see some of the comments that are coming through on our chat just are saying just that, this, this deep listening that attends to the complexities of our own experience and the experience of others. Um, in conversation with who God is, that 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 is a gift that is offered in this sort of space, isn't it? Uh, that's rarely offered. Yes, yes, and we, you know, we we become. I, I I think of myself always, you know, in my pedagogical role, you know, which is different from the therapeutic role that I need to cover sometimes, or the one of the consultant, you know. It's the, 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 the formative role of a teacher is essential in this, in, in this particular paradigm of uh, teaching students how to develop a pastoral theological method for care. Do you know, like how, how do they bring the ingredients together? And, um, and, and that's, that's been, you know, for me, uh, like a, a source of ongoing learning, do you know, like how do we do that best? You know, how do we create the space in the classroom balanced, you know, with knowledge? You know, they have to really dig into some theory as well, you know, and read lots of books and, and do write papers as a way of formulating and reformulating their theology. But the, in, the giving them the space to begin to really listen and develop self-awareness about what 
they bring as a self in ministry, it's, 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 it's crucial, you know, to me that that's, that's the, the gift of this uh, discipline as well, yeah. you know, the discipline of pastoral care. But, you know, um, Francesca, I, um, I shadowed you when you taught this unit back in 2012 or 13 um, and watched what unfolded in the classroom, which was actually uh, also predicated on relationship, that the, there is a trust that needs to develop between the, the, the lecturer and the, uh, and, and, and the participant, the student, the, the one eager to kind of grasp on you. Know, that trust is, is, is actually quite a, a potent force in the room, I think. Yes. Um, for that reason, and I have had to do a lot of soul searching about what kind of teacher I want to be. And uh, I have determined that the best and most authentic way to teach pastoral care is to be willing to be in the trench with the students. You know, I, I, I use a lot of autobiographical information, you know, like I, I, I don't make up case studies because I have plenty of situations that I haven't resolved in my own therapeutic practice or memories of chaplaincy where I felt like I failed and didn't say the right thing. So I tend to bring the reality of my own pastoral experience mm -hmm. to the students so that they can see how it is modeled. Like I cannot expect them to do something like to, um, to have trust from the people who turn to them for care if I haven't uh, modeled for them how it is to give and receive trust in a relationship. You know, this, this becomes the template in the classroom to experience that. And uh, I understand that this doing it virtually on Zoom is going to be a little bit more complicated. Well, that was uh, one of my questions because you, you, yeah. in fact, the trust between the trust within the classroom and or almost like this two dimensional space where I need to pinch you to see if you're really humans on the other side of my screen. You know, that, that sense of um, change that we've adapted as a, as a um, society, that, that trust is, is something we're learning, but communication can become a challenge. And I'm conscious, one, uh, someone has just been asking on the chat about um, how we develop environments whereby uh, young people particularly was this question but all of us can kind of grapple with the losses that are involved in this shift as a society I mean I'm I'm happy to be quick to say and there are games look we've got Francesca on the other side of the world but that ain't going to cut it for a whole generation who are losing the depth of interactions that are occurring for for them so how, how do you reckon that's going to work out what are you doing with that well, you know, I, I think the situation of the global pandemic and this social distancing, you know, the need to be um, protecting ourselves and each other um, has a little bit uh, speeded up the process of moving education online. But I remember already in the beginning of my teaching career, I'm talking about 15 years ago in the US, we were already pondering these questions, you know, like what's the best way to reach people who cannot afford to come to the classroom, cannot afford to be, and they deserve to be reached wherever they are in the world. So as much as I always thought that teaching pastoral care and counseling skills over a screen is extremely challenging, I also always open myself to that possibility because I always had such a love for the world and I would meet people that say, how can I get an education? with you, you know, with your school, wherever you are. And I was like, I wish we could extend this in an online program. So it's like now we, we, we have to do it. We don't have the choice. It's not for, um, yeah, it's not a choice. We have to do it. And so I think that requires the, the development of some other human capacities. We have them within ourselves. We just have to, um, you know, practice them like a muscle, you know, and the, one of these capacities is to stay engaged even when it's hard. I mean, I know students, you know, they want to uh, tune out, you know, they want to put uh, a fixed screen while we are on a classroom space because 
I've been teaching already courses online. And I say, you have to give us the grace not to do that. And we give each other the grace of not looking at your background, not looking at, you know, what your contexts can be, because some people are embarrassed about where they are zooming in. So we need to honor that. But, you know, we also need to be uh, giving each other the, the, the gift of accountability, you know, so if, I, if somebody's sharing and in our classes in pastoral care, people share from the heart, you know, they have to say something um, that makes them maybe feel vulnerable or embarrassed. We have to give each other the grace not to be, you know, drinking your coffee or eating your food, hiding, you know, it's like this little um, gifts, you know, this, this capacities to be uh, a full grown up human being you know, and do the best with the learning process, which is a privilege. If anybody's joining in with Zoom, it means, first of all, they have a computer, they have a Wi-Fi that works. That can't be said for all people in the world. Mm -hmm. Many people would like to do that, but they can't. And mm -hmm. so to honor the privilege and treat it with, uh, with, uh, with sacredness, you know, this is a new sacred space we are developing together mm -hmm. and we have to enter it with that posture. And um, so that's that's the best I can think of, you know, to mitigate, navigate the difficulties of not being together. Yeah, yeah. And I think we're all learning, you know, um, and this far down the track, um, you know, there are some skills that are emerging. Um, it's 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 we're yet to see what's going to happen for our societies for you in in the Netherlands um, you, you know you're grappling grappling with one level of COVID in Melbourne here we're we're grappling with another level of COVID um, and the uh, levels of um, uh, I suppose social fear but also the uh, disconnect which is different from differentiation um, see you see Key, it occurs to me, Francesca, that key to this whole area of um, grief and loss is the whole notion of we grieve and we lose and we experience loss. We suffer because something matters. We, we are attached to that something. And as a society, we've been attached to something which has kind of become much more flimsy for us. So there is kind of this deep seated um, self-protection almost from that loss. And is that something you're observing in your context that kind of, and, and attachment as a, well, attachment as a theory is a big thing. Yeah. So I, I think there is a reason, you know, that uh, the, the, the scientific community, you know, the economists, you know, the people are referring to this moment of history as a, uh, as a, um, a collective traumatic experience, you know. So whether we are aware of the impact of the overlay of what's happening around the world, whether we are aware of it directly or not, it, it is impacting us, you know, so that that's a very key principle to remember. And what, what does that mean in practical life? So now in Melbourne, I know, you know, you have gone back into lockdown and that's created again, you know, surfaced again, uh, fear, suspiciousness, you know, maybe controversial opinions about is it the right thing to do or not, you know, we've, we've visited all the gamut of possible <laughs> responses to things we don't like, because that's human nature, right? Here in Holland, it's a bit different, even than other countries in Europe, from the beginning, there was a lot of freedom. You know, people could, the restaurants were closed, you know, the social non-necessity businesses were closed, but everybody could always be free to walk, to engage in some kind of with respect, with social engagement. What that does is then, can make people think there is no danger, you know, there is not a real danger going on, but it is. And what I see it is in the interaction of people with each other, the social fear that this has generated, even when we can freely go to supermarkets without a mask, even when we can use public transportation, um, you know, it's, it's um, so this tells me that there is the traumatic overlay is impacting us 
in the in intrapsychically, you know, like in our it, it is trickling into our brain slowly but surely. And it's beginning to show interpersonally, you know, in the way that we treat each other and the way we are suspicious of people coming as tourists in this country, you know. So, and and all of that explains how certain cultures and countries relate to issues of control and grief and loss and the fragility of human existence, because that's what this pandemic is exposing for all of us. Yes. So, it, so oh, I'm sorry. I, what I was going to say was it exposes, there's been a lot written here about the fault lines. It, it exposes the social fault lines, but it also disrupts us enough to, to expose those terms that we talked about before, operational theology and our espoused theology and the limits of our espoused theology, you know, the, 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 the quick off the, the quick off the mark. Um, theological statements compared to the underlying convictions that actually emerge when we're in in trauma or in stress and are still present to us because we are still in this time and space yes I mean we haven't moved in the post-traumatic no. state of the pandemic I mean it's still happening we see yeah. countries regressing you know to to because of the peaks of the of the contagion and uh, expectations of the economic disasters, you know, which we are not there to face yet because they're currently happening. Yeah. So that requires that we engage this, this, the present, not the future yet, but the present, that we stay in the present in a particular way. And that's why I really feel excited and also a little bit uh, nervous about teaching this course at this particular time, because it's not that I have form the way I taught it many years ago, it would be completely different yeah. because we are in the thick, in the throes of losses that are uncontrollable, uncountable, almost, you know, they're everywhere from uh, you know the opportunity to be with loved ones graduations we've missed conferences you know and people are, are losing jobs you know this is very severe and people they love i mean yeah. Yeah. the real losses of human life yeah. happening as well and so to teach it now it will be a challenge for me but i am a student with my students yeah yeah we've got much to learn from one another i, I i'm really conscious that and something's coming through the feed, which is stimulating my thought here, and I'll test it against you with Francesca, but there is this, um, because attachment theory is core to the whole theories around um, suffering in, uh, suffering grief and loss. Um, and I'm pondering whether what you listed off a whole lot of losses. And I'm wondering whether for young people, one of those key losses is the, the predictability of my future. Now, uh, young people's future is never actually predictable but there are dreams and there are possibilities that they reach for and there are um, they anticipate the shape of what life will be and are working toward it and we we've heard that repeatedly with our year 12 students you know this this has disrupted what I had hoped for and longed for so and they haven't in, in a sense young people haven't lived long enough to see any a lot of those waves or many making sweeping statements is always awkward in a time like this but it seems to me that grief you know the attachment for young people of their future to their future to their story is something they're almost grieving and anticipating grieving all at the same time so you know there is this thing called anticipatory grief isn't there that that sits in the midst of this tell us a little bit about that yeah well the first thing that comes to mind in response is that that's why studying is important it's important to have a theory of some kind you know that helps us have a framework to understand human experience and you mentioned attachment because in the field of pastoral care attachment theory or systems theory you know of variation or combination of the two have been you know the chosen psychological theories to yep. complement theology and spirituality, you know, because we look at the 
at the body of Christ as a family with attachments and relationships, you know, therefore this, they lend themselves easily to this task. But with, with the study of, of trauma and grief and loss, particularly attachment theory, I think comes useful. And that is what I will be introducing the students to as a framework to understand, for instance, that to understand that what we grieve is correlated the way we grieve is correlated to our attachment style, which is something that begins in the early stages of our life. And this could be studied, you know, and learned or investigated in our personal lives and also collectively. You know, we can see how culture uh, shapes the way we, we, we think about relationships and attachments. For instance, in some of the Western cultures where um, you know, we are more individualistic, you know, individually based rather than in some of the cultures where there are more collective, you know, based on collective experiences, we tend to think even of the grieving process differently. You know, we tend to, to think a certain amount of prescribed time should be enough, you know, correlated to how important was this loss for you. You know, we have all sorts of criteria to prioritize or to, to, to tell others what is important to grieve or not. Well, for a teenager, I, I refer to the American context because that's what I know best, you know, to miss the prom party this year, it was huge. I know children of my friends, you know, were devastated by that because it's one, it's a rite of passage for them, you know, and we don't have that many in our, uh, Western societies, you know, these rights over these moments where you move into officially into another stage of life. Okay, they can be silly sometimes, but still human beings need them, you know? And so what do we do in the absence of these collective spaces where to celebrate, for instance, graduation, you know, or to imagine going to college, which for some kids is not possible right now. So they can't even travel to visit the colleges they want to attend. So this requires, from my perspective, and using attachment theory, the, the, the modeling of wise, spiritually and emotionally wise mentors, uh, parents, friends, you know, that can stay with the reality of grief that the young people are experiencing, and yet can with wisdom and we care and care really being the key word here, you know, help them hold this new truth about humanity. We don't control our future. You know, we can't make plans for 20 years ahead. Our fathers, my grandparents knew that they couldn't do that. We have gotten a little bit comfortable thinking we can long-term and now we're being taught a new lesson about vulnerability and fragility and yeah, um, yeah. Well, interesting Francesca because our parents and our grandparents I suppose the the, the people before us have had um, rituals and rites that have helped them to navigate their way and there's been a lot of um, research by people like Driver who talk about if we lose our rituals, we'll lose our way, you know, how do we create those um, rites of rites of passage and you know things like the promo one but rites of passage but I'd want to kind of say the rituals of our tradition or the rituals of our faith or and emerging rituals um, and uh, you know there is something about how in this space we have been prompted to need to be creative about what they will look like so yeah. We, we can't do them the way we did them. Our, our rituals and our rites are done. And there are some wonderful things emerging, you know, yeah. um, people creatively inviting people near and far to a funeral via Zoom. But but the ritual remains. It's just adapted. It's, it's still telling us who we are. It's still the thread. Um, uh, if, we lose, if we lose those threads, we lose something of our larger human story, the archetypal part of our story, I think. Yes, yes. I think what you name, Anne, is one of the most beautiful pieces of our theology, mm -hmm. you know, like that we have been created with certain gifts. 
So psychology tells us that trauma does something. You know, in the grips of deep grief, we get stunted. You know, we regress somehow, you know, developmentally sometimes, you know, for a short period of time or for a long period of time. That's what the human sciences tell us. But then we have theology that reminds us that we, we have incredible gifts and capacities that are given naturally to us by God. Creativity is one of them. Yeah. Imagination is another one, you know. And uh, when I explain trauma theory, you know, we, we learn that, you know, the box of memory and imagination are kind of really the same, you know, close in the brain. And so as we can pull up an, a memory from the past, we can also generate an image of something we desire in the future. You know, it's in the, in, in, it's in the, but pain, suffering kind of blocks that capacity a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the best way to think about what a pastoral care or a spiritual care person can do in a context of grief and loss. It's like join people to activate the imagination again, even when it looks so hard, you know, and say, but let's try together. Let's make a gentle uh, effort, you know, to what would you like to see happen when you will be able to, you know, so that we don't deny the reality of the present and the suffering that we are in, but we also don't get so paralyzed by it that we stop imagining and we stop creating. And so I think that's what we have witnessed in, in, the, in the context of this pandemic, how people have become creative. You know, one of the things that I have generated here in Amsterdam, because I was also stuck by myself in, in a country that I don't know many people, I don't speak the language. I hadn't had the time to make many friends when I moved here. And so I was connected with a, a refugee organization that I volunteered at. And we created spaces for cooking together online through Zoom. So we would help each other cook. So that cuts across religion, cultural, sometimes even language difficulties. And food, the yep. biggest you know, metaphor from our scriptures, you know, Jesus becoming the bread of life, sharing food, but in all kinds of spiritual traditions, the idea of coming together is very strong you know so people eating a meal together over the computer and teaching each other the importance of that that's a creative use of our imagination you know to think outside the box how can we be with people even when we can't join them physically so i think we have plenty of these stories around the world that have surprised all of us you know yeah that's Definitely. Absolutely, and and um, and gathering up the images or the metaphors that that we can, um, if you like, rely upon that that mm -hmm. tell us that we know. The other little um, gem that I heard you hint at before is one that that you know, in this experience of grief and loss, we almost get caught in time where time telescopes in and out and um you know this moment you know you need a year to get over it but of course in grief and loss um in that experience of grief it, it telescopes in and out and a day seems a lifetime and many years seems like it was a moment ago and you know that is what i reckon uh, i hear people saying in this COVID space oh was that last week they we, we actually lose track of those times and when you're in the midst of trauma or in the midst of grief or in the midst of a suffering experience that's quite as intense as what's going on broadly time is a curious thing and i think our theology helps us there you know, I think our image of a, a larger perspective actually supports our capacity to, 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 to reimagine time and rituals do that and all sorts of things do it. But I reckon our theology sits there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's beautiful. And you're right. I mean, I think uh, trauma theory explains that whole idea of time the best that I have yeah. found in literature. Yeah. You know, there is a before and after that is never a before without the after, you know, in terms of our temporal uh, sense of, of time and space. Right? Time. Yep. Yes. And it feels like being stuck, to use the theological language, in a, a holy Saturday forever. 
do you know there is the, the experience of the good friday to you know again to use the easter uh, metaphor and then there is the knowledge that the resurrection will come but the people who are caught in the same in a state of traumatization and deep grief and loss can do that just as well feel stuck in this holy saturday space you know so there is everything loses perspective slightly and yep. what as you mentioned what theology does the whole language about god being from the beginning at the end of time you know this 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 thing that the time in the way we understand it it's not really relevant to god i mean it is because it's relevant to us and but it also in the transcendent aspect of god it isn't that important you know mm -hmm. and the future has already been beheld and that's where for instance the theology of the mystics mm -hmm. is so beautiful at this point you know a person like julian or norwich you know talking about all shall be well okay what what does that mean while i'm losing my job i cannot see the people i love i am as a constant threat of dying you know or infecting somebody you know all these things what how how do i take that in that all shall be well yeah and the cliches that are trotted out at us like that in the midst of, of grief yes. are, are, are actually traumatizing themselves they can be really yeah. destructive despite the fact that there's a deeper truth within the exactly. so the point is to guide people to go to that yeah. depth of truthfulness of these statements because julian didn't say it in in the midst of a party you know she didn't come out with that theology of hope in the midst of things going well you know there was a war and a pandemic the black plague you know was destroying most of europe at the time so to listen to the voices of wisdom and spiritual depth of anybody in our whatever spiritual tradition we're in that's really essential you know because it gives us perspective i think that's what gets taken away from us yeah in suffering so, so tell us a little bit then uh, about this uh it's a particular unit of study you're going to be offering at whitley what's it going to look like for students do you have a so I I love um, I love teaching. I think I've I've already said that, and uh, I love <laughs> I love having the the classroom space as the space where we all learn together. So I, I I prepare a lot, of course, you know, in terms of theoretical knowledge, but then the most beautiful part that will happen in the unit is the co construction of learning that comes from inviting students to bring their own questions their reasons for coming to a course like that because there always are some very important ones to 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 name uh, the professional roles that some of the students will cover you know in their in their life so to join together in a process of learning um, will be you know the, the one of the main criteria for teaching this course so that everybody's invited to bring what they really care about the reasons they're there so they can expect that to be fully valued with their whole full self you know in what they bring to the course and so in the in the in, te in, in terms of a format what i like to do always is to mix up pedagogical instruction, you know, the traditional lecturing. I mean, I want to share some of the knowledge. I think that's really important. It is always intertwined with pastoral experience, you know, so to illustrate how theory works in practice on the ground, I have plenty of that integration that I will offer them. But I would say another third of the course, you know, will be for students to work on themselves. Like I want to give them really practical challenges you know that uh, that they can they can engage personally for instance if they are not in a in a profession and then helping profession you know they can go off and do this work on their own through their community through their relationships of friendships and family and those who are in professional ministry or other helping professions they can go into their communities of work to put in practice, to experiment, or you know what, what they're learning in the classroom. 
so that there is um, a balanced you know, integration of um, information and formation and practical application, because ultimately the unit is to empower people to be better carers. Oh, you know, so let me repeat that back. So you said information, formation and application. That's nice. We should we should be advertising using that. Francesca, <laughs> the, the reality is that you, you actually, you can study theories, but unless we connect this with one another, with our own stories, then it, it's, it's, not gonna, um, it's not going to change the world. It's not gonna change us. It's not gonna have its impact in the world. Um, so do, do you think that people need, um, I've had a couple of questions come to me about, do, do I need to be someone who is currently in our ministry of some sort, whether it's in a hospital or a, a church or whatever, in order to be able to do a course like this? Is this just about that? Um, no, I mean, I would love to see people from all walks of life joining the course because that provides the best richness for all of us, you know, so yeah. for selfish reasons, I'd love to see people from as many, uh, you know, uh, background interests as possible, the personal, the professional, um, you know, the, the, the spiritual, the human, you know, people can join for humanitarian purposes, you know, they think they want to understand better what's happening to humanity and uh, you know so that that would all be be welcome but uh, for sure I think the way the course is structured it, it will offer uh, you know the opportunity for learning on whatever level or whatever uh, whatever pace people are you know or whatever place in their lives that yeah. they they can make some good use of, of the learning and uh, people in all kinds of helping professions, I think would really benefit from it. It's be because, you know, we will stay on top of the latest uh, um, research on grief and loss theory and trauma, which I will try to bring together. And uh, in the understanding of counseling skills, listening, you know, uh, so I think that that could that could be helpful in any area of engagement, human engagement. Yes, I think so. And I, I think the other thing is that this particular con social context of COVID um, provides us with, um, if you like, an experience that's live, like it's current, it's present yeah. to us. But a couple of people have commented in the chat, and I think they're right, in the midst of trauma, in the midst of the experience of trauma, it is, re it is really difficult, I, maybe I could say impossible, to reflect upon the trauma. So we almost need other frame, a larger framework to, and it's there, I, I guess that's what I say. There is a larger framework in which we need to claim the resources to navigate this space. It can't be done in the moment. It's like, this is one bit of a picture, does that? ring true i think i think and this if i understand the question well this is always the dilemma for instance of teaching our particular discipline oh, yeah. like I, I talk about um some traumatic experience in the general teaching of pastoral care like it doesn't even have to be so specific about suffering pastoral mm -hmm. care is about joining people when they're hurting and that could be in the form of uh, somebody's sexual abuse, you know, somebody was in a traumatic accident. It's just general human suffering, things that can happen. Well, there's somebody in the classroom that gets triggered. You know, so you're inviting them to listen, process theory while they're being activated, you know, in something so personal. Now, Let's take that example and move it into this particular context where we are asking people to think, talk about grief and loss and trauma in particular. Well, they turn off the webinar or the, the teaching and it's all around them. Yeah. You know, so I, I get that. It's, it's always complicated to navigate these two spaces. You know, how do we turn on the learning brain, if you will, you know, the rational brain not to the neglect and to the abuse of the emotional brain, you know, that tells us that something is not right in the world, yeah. which happens, especially when we, if we 
hear somebody sh sharing something in the classroom or I bring a story or a video, you know, so that's, that's part of the journey of doing this together. Yeah. I think that's the beauty of the community where a person feels a bit more exposed and vulnerable in one particular moment. The rest of the community can be there yeah. and, and me, you know, have to trust in my capacity to facilitate this movement mm -hmm. and to stop when it's necessary, you know, and take in what's happening in the present. Yeah. I think that's really important. Uh, to create safety within that space. I, I, as you're talking, I'm reminded of um, the work by Emmanuel Lati, who talks about, um, I am like, I'm like all people, I have a share human experience. I'm, I am like some people, you know, and I am like none. I have my own unique experience. And that principle of care allows the individual to sit intimately with their story uh, and, and with, with another. Um, but it also allows me to feel that I'm not alone, that I actually yeah. share my story with others and that this is the human condition, you know, it, it, it expands me from, from the singular to the whole. Yes, yes. Emmanuel was my dissertation advisor, by oh, the way, in yes. the US. Yes, so I know his work really closely and we will use some of his work because he talks about interpathy, you know, so not empathy, but interpathy, which is, you know, empathy shared across cultures of diversity. And that's going to be a very important dimension of the course, you know, that we pay attention to the particularity of human experience, not just to the, okay, we're all humans, yeah, we're all exposed to some of this suffering, but each one of us will experience it, process it, and move through it differently. Yeah. And that's going back to attachment theory. That makes a difference. You know, the template that we have in our background, it's what makes the difference about resilience. You know, like how we move through post-traumatic growth, some people call it, you know, that there is growth after trauma, after loss, and how do we get there has a lot to do with our beginnings in life, our forms of attachment and the relationships of accountability and love and compassion that are around us when we are experiencing um, suffering. Yeah, that will accompany us on the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what a wonderful thing this is. Um, I, uh, I, I'm anticipating that this is going to create a, a, a real opportunity for people to look at themselves, to look at how they are within a particular social context, to imagine and unpack what it means to do this within a faith context, within their own faith context and their own faith frameworks, um, and, and to feel a little bit more comfortable about what it means to do that accompanying of one another on the way. You know, I think that's a wonderful thing, Francesca. You have been so generous with us. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to have a little skim down. I, I, I reckon that probably I need to tell people about when and how this might all work. What, what we're doing is we're talking about um, a, a particular unit of study that Whitley is offering, oh gosh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, called uh, Pastoral and Spiritual Care in Suffering, Grief and Loss. It, it'll happen on Wednesday evenings. Um, throughout second semester, starting on Wednesday the 29th. Um, it'll be morning in the Netherlands. So Francesca will be up and bright and you can be sitting back with your cup of tea in the evening uh, studying this. Um, Whitley, this semester is offering uh, the opportunity for students to audit some, some, uh, some of these courses. So you don't have to enrol in a course. You can actually do just this thing and uh, if you do that if you enroll in that by Friday then there's a special price I think of $350 or something so you can do it like that or you can actually enroll in a unit like this as part of an award and if you already have a degree it can be an award as small as three units in a graduate certificate that's my dean's hat you know you can actually start on the track towards doing some postgraduate or even undergraduate study 
to equip you to um, serve in whatever way you're called to, as, as you heard uh, Francesca say, you know, her own sense of call and pull was to go and go to exotic places. I, I kind of think of the Netherlands as exotic, Francesca, but anyway, go to exotic places as a missionary. Well, here she is returning to us and bringing with, uh, with her the story that um, has shaped her to, to, to lead us on our way of pondering these, these important questions. So I hope you can join, Francesca. I hope you can join us at Whitley. And, um, uh, and I think there's a link on Facebook that you can um, follow up that. And certainly you can contact us at Whitley through the office, either way is fine. Um, you might want to particularly find out some specifics from Francesca about what it might look like. And I think you're happy for that, aren't you, Francesca? Um, yeah. And to follow that through our Facebook link tonight on the Whitley Facebook page, and we'll forward anything to you. Um, oh gosh, are there any things that I have forgotten? I don't think so. But I would wanna say thank you. Are there any final words you would have for us tonight, Francesca, as we think about these things? I, I, I don't know, I feel so much excitement. I have a heart full of gratitude for the opening uh, for me to share this. And uh, I, I really look forward to all that I will learn mm -hmm. from, from being with you in that particular uh, cultural context of Australia, which uh, it's, a, it's a strong part of my heart as well. So thank you. And I look forward to seeing lots of students and colleagues. <laughs> well, listen to this. She uses all the right language, this woman, because this is actually about a mutuality of learning. Of course, you bring a, a, a whole background and wisdom to bear. And so do you as learners bring that too. And, and I, just, I just look forward to seeing what unfolds in the next little while. So be in touch and, and welcome back to Whitley, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night.